Welcome back. We're talking about Fidel Castro, who just celebrated his 90th birthday and Cuba's developing relationship with the United States. Let's get back to our panel. Eric, I want to talk about something that Christina mentioned a moment ago, and the fact that is, you know, you get these two countries, the United States and Cuba, trying to restore relations, but at the same time, the embargo, the blockade, as it's called as well, is still in place. Are we going to see any kind of significant change for ordinary Cubans if this embargo remains in place? Well, uh, first of all, I, I think you have to distinguish between different right. relations. The other one is change within Cuba, yeah. or things can mix them up. But in, in brief, I think in terms of change, it really hasn't happened yet, because of course, and all the permitted direct Fi is only scheduled to, to accept elections, internet access, things like that, is only being established right now. So, and the U.S. government and the Cuban government are right now in negotiations to do so. Uh, but quite clearly, the embargo has had a tremendous effect, and in fact, is the largest issue, and that's an act of Congress. Uh, it's not um, the President or the State Department saying, no, we're going to stop doing that. And so it really depends uh, on that. In my sense is that, uh, at least it looks like right now, uh, with the elections um, coming up in presidential elections in the United States, that uh, Congress might change quite a lot. So there might be new opportunities here uh, to start thinking about um, getting rid of the embargo, which takes an act of Congress uh, to do so. So a question whether that happens or not. For one thing, uh, tourism, uh, for example, you cannot vote as a tourist, uh, as an American, mm. uh, to Cuba. You actually have to have a purposeful visit. In other words, you have to have some kind of reason, so you can't just go for spring break or something like that. So it's a little bit more difficult. So clearly many of the changes haven't really happened yet, and hopefully they will relatively soon. But Congress may have political reasons for keeping that embargo in place, but a lot of this change is being driven right now by business in the United States, isn't it? Correct. Business is very much looking forward to opening up new markets. Yeah. Uh, but there, the Cuban government has been very, very careful because, again, uh, one thing that is that maybe in the United States uh, we want to see certain kind of change, but the Cuban government might not. And so I think they're very careful in uh, starting uh, those changes because uh, clearly the Cuban government thinks of itself as remaining in power forever. Yeah. And if you want to remain in power forever, what do you need to do uh, to do that? And uh, that's really what the negotiations are about to a large extent. Right. Ambassador, what is the feeling in Cuba? Is there optimism there that this embargo, this blockade will be lifted soon and that there'll be more business, a more of a business relationship between the two countries? You cannot say that everybody thinks the same way. Personally, I am cautiously optimistic. I think a situation might rise that we will have uh, the lifting of the embargo. I think that probably is going to happen in the next four or five years at the most, but maybe earlier, as Eric said, it depends very much on the results of the American election. Uh, uh, my suspicion, or my bet, is that uh, Hillary Clinton probably will be elected president, and, um, and if she's elected president, maybe the Democrats uh, get the control of the Senate and, and the House. Then something might happen very quickly. Uh, if Trump wins, that's a different situation because with Trump will win the Republican Party and the enemies of doing anything with Cuba that is significant are in the it, it, There is a big, a big question mark there, but think that the logic of what's happening is that it is in the best interest of the United States eventually to leave the embargo because of what it means for businesses in the United States. There is also, of course, what I call the Roberta Flack strategy, the killing me softly with your song strategy. Many people in the U.S. government think that they can undermine the Cuban government by approaching us with that kind of, uh, of uh, strategy. I doubt it. I don't think that's going to happen. But welcome, if that's the strategy that the U.S. government is going to take. I, am, I think we are ready to, to face it and, um, and start developing. Remember, we are in the middle of an economic transformation in Cuba. This economic transformation in Cuba is very significant and very hard to carry out. And the U.S. government has to learn how to deal with these changes because they don't know. That's the main problem that they have when they are approaching Cuba. Their policies are, um, uh, are based on the past. And Cuba is changing, so they'll have to look 
in a different way. Yes, it's important, the private sector, but, but it's important to have something to do with the state sector. Take the case of um, Star, uh, this uh, hotel company, I forgot now the, the name, Starwood. Starwood, yes. They had to deal with a Cuban company, and a Cuban company owned by the military. Christina, when we talk about the blockade or the embargo, how does it affect ordinary Cubans, average Cubans, on a daily basis? How has it affected them for the past several decades? Well, uh, in pretty much everything. Uh, Cuba is a, a poor country in terms of resources, uh, so we, we've, is not, uh, we are a poor country, and we were before the blockade. But of course, anything that we've tried to do in these years is limited by the blockade. If the uh, government wants to buy something that has more than now, more, more than 25% of U.S. technology, it used to be 14% of U.S. technology. Can you imagine how many things has this amount of percentage of U.S. technology? You just can't buy it. If something has Cuban nickel, then the U.S. companies cannot buy that if it has a certain percentage. We cannot use dollars, so in every kind of transaction or operation that we want to do, we have to think about that. We have to change the currency, so we lost money in between. We have to find a bank to do that. So everything is harder. Everything is more complicated. That alongside with the fact that we are, in fact, a poor country and that we've had problems of ourselves that taking into consideration that we're inventing, we're creating a new model for the economy, of course, all of that uh, creates a harsh situation for Cuba. And uh, it's important, and that's the difference, why is it, we call it a blockade and the U.S. causes an embargo. It's not exclusively a bilateral thing between Cuba and the U.S. because it affects every kind of relation that Cuba ha wants to have with the world. If any country of the world wants to have a relationship with Cuba in any way, the embargo or the blockade has a deal with us. It. So it's extraterritorial. It's not exclusive, uh, exclusively a bilateral thing. That's why it's so strong. I even have met some Americans that have told me that no, knowing from the example of Cuba is where they actually get to know how powerful the U.S. is in these terms. So that's why it's still so strong. And when I think about the future of Cuba, the future that is on my gen generation's uh, shoulders, I do want to see more U.S. companies and more business with the U.S., but with caution because the kind of model that we had before 1959 was awful and was a very uh, unequal relation, the big country taking over the small one. So we do need to be cautious because the kind of experience that we have is awful. So we have to invent this new relation in which we take advantage of this new link and also the U.S., but not just l giving the country or just let it, letting them take it over, which would be the normal, the logic thing to happen, taking into consideration that we're 90 miles away. So it's kind of hard to develop your economy, to find this new model, and also find a balance between your international relations in terms of economy is a big task ahead. Right, and Cuba has made its concerns known and doesn't want to be overwhelmed by United States business in a very short space of time. Eric, another spanner in the works in the relationship, and that is we hear of these claims and counterclaims for damages. Um, the United States says uh, it needs to be paid damages for uh, properties that were nationalized after the revolution in Cuba, and Cuba says we need to be paid for all the damage that's been done by the embargo. Do we know what's the status of those talks, where that's going to go? Well, uh, what I have read, and, and I'm not privy to any of the conversations, mm -hmm. is that uh, things are going very, very slowly. Because here, there are claims, counterclaims, and right. uh, there, there's really, uh, I think, very hard negotiations going on right now uh, between the two parties. And my sense is that they haven't gotten very far. Uh, so. Um, uh, you know, that, that's probably one other issue that, that uh, we have to think about. Uh, I agree with my, uh, with my Cuban um, co-participants here that uh, the embargo or the blockade really is the biggest issue of them all. But these legal issues have to be resolved because otherwise uh, it's going to be very difficult legally to um, to not have this embargo. And certainly Congress and certain Congress uh, people uh, such as Marco Rubio or even on the um, American side, on the Democratic side, uh, Bob Menendez, for example, mm -hmm. um, are very much against lifting of the embargo and uh, clearly they would have to have some palliative to see that, that many of these legal issues are resolved. Uh, because uh, they actually get campaign uh, contributions from some of the companies who would want to uh, be um, 
uh, compensated uh, for what they had lost many years ago. Ambassador Al Zugre, I want to get back to Fidel Castro's 90th birthday. He is seen as the revered leader in Cuba, as the father of the revolution. What do you believe on his 90th birthday is his greatest impact on Cuba, his legacy, if you like? I think his legacies are basically in two fields, the field of independence and make Cuba an important actor in the international scene. Right now, Cuba is both uh, a power broker, a peaceful and humanitarian power broker on many issues in the world. It can help Colombia reach peace. It can send doctors to fight Ebola in Africa. But at the same time, I think Cuba has created in its external relationship what one might call a norm provider country. Cuba provides norms of how to behave between countries, and this is very highly appreciated in the third world. I think both of them are uh, internationally that. And secondly, there is, of course, the, the, the empowerment and the changing of the situation in Cuba. Remember, Cuba was a country that was in the hands of an oligarchy that exploited the rest of the country. Um, uh, social rights, social justice was a very low level. With Fidel Castro, all that changed. I want to say just a little, some little thing about what Eric said. The legal issue of the nationalization process is not such a difficult thing. It is legal. It has to be dealt in a legal way. And I have been part of a government commission that has been studying this subject. And the Cuban side is very realistic about what it has to pay, but it demands that it be paid. So it, it, it is a question of the political will of the United States uh, to do that. By the way, most of the companies got already paid because they were paid by the American government through the uh, Claims Commission, the uh, U.S. Claims Commission. Okay, and we have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for joining us.